friends, and welcome to All By My Shelf. I'm Miss Rachel, and it's so nice to see you. But one of the things I've noticed is you look a little different today. Have you, by any chance, pulled a sword out of a stone recently? Well, you're in luck. This is the panel for you, because it's called Merlin's Beard. It's all about knights, heroes, mystical swords, all that sort of stuff. Today's panelists are Amy Rose Capetta, Corey McCarthy, Kirsten White, Tracy Dion, and E.K. Johnston. If you're a Glenside patron, click the link in the description below marked Glenside. It'll bring you to a list of all of the books talked about during today's panel that are available as ebooks for you to check out now, or you can fill out the form that's listed there, and then you can tell me exactly which books you'd like to have put on hold for you in hard copy when the library is able to reopen. I hope you enjoy this panel. Beard Arthurian panel. Um, would you all be able to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your book or books? Anyone can start. I'm E.K. Johnston. I'll go first because I don't know. <laughs> nobody else is going. Um, I have several books, some of which involve knights, many of which are inspired by Arthurian stories because they've made me angry for several decades now. Um, and I have a book coming out, hopefully in the future, that will be like a King Arthur in space, but I can't talk about it super detailed, um, but we're going to talk around it as much as possible. Hi, Someone I'm else Tracy. Has to go <laughs> yeah, I, will, I, will, I was like, this is me. I feel like it. It's the moment. Uh, this is Tracy uh, Dion speaking. I am um, writing um, a series, but my first book comes out this fall. It's called Legend Born. It is a YA contemporary fantasy, King Arthur reimagining um, with a 16 year old black girl in the center of the story. And she's actually not even really interested in King Arthur. She's interested in finding out what happened to her mother who died under mysterious circumstances and then gets thrown into this Arthuriana world that's very modern and up to date and um, has a lot of demons. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Kirsten White. I am the author of 16 books for young readers, including the Anti-Darken Trilogy, um, Slayer and Chosen, The Dark Son of Liz Frankenstein, some others, who knows what they are. Um, and my most recent series is the Camelot Rising Trilogy. The first book is The Guinevere Deception, and book two, The Camelot Betrayal, comes out in November. Um, it's, a, it's a retelling of Arthurian legend centered around Guinevere, set in a, a fairly traditional Camelot setting, but this time looking at all the stories that we don't tell when we tell Arthur's stories. Oh, so I have legend born. I just had to say I'm so excited. So do I. Hey, we Wait. Oh my god. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Oh, I'm wicked jealous. Uh, um, oh, we can make it happen. <laughs> okay, okay, that, that would be excellent. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Corey McCarthy. I'm Amy Rose Capetta. And we wrote uh, Once in Future, which I managed to go grab. Um, and its sequel, Sword in the Stars, which, which are, just came out. which is uh, Gender Bent King Arthur in Space um, with lots and lots and lots of queer people. <laughs> the Knights of the Rainbow. The Knights of the Rainbow. Yes. Um, would you like to speak? Yes. Um, <laughs> so the main characters are Ari, who is the 42nd reincarnation of King Arthur and the first girl in the line. And also the other point of view character is Merlin, who is 
be Merlin, but he, we're so far in the future that he's now aged backwards to the point that he is finally a teenager and he's really unhappy about it and sort of starts from there. So that's, yes, that's where we are. <laughs> um, so what is it about the King Arthur legends um, that sort of brought you to the concept of your stories? I, what, I brought, think what, what brought you to King Arthur? What brought me to King Arthur was mm -hmm. my wonderful spouse telling me over and over again that they wanted to write a, a book about girl King Arthur and me saying, yes, please, I want to read that book. Write that book right now so I can read it. Yeah. That's really how I got here. <laughs> yes, just been consuming King Arthur from like everything from movies and television and books to songs and things my whole life and being like, where's girl King Arthur? Like that's a no-brainer that's going to happen at some point. Um, and so I've just wanted, I wanted this forever. <laughs> and I just kept sort of nudging. And you made it possible, so. I think the first King Arthur story I ever saw was the musical Camelot. Um, and I remember getting to the end and being like, that was really dumb. Why didn't they just talk about their problems at any point in this story? And then my mother was like, I've got some bad news for you. <laughs> um, and I read all of the other stories that I could get my hands on. And I was like, I really enjoy these stories, but there's parts of them that are like, either I don't like them or like, but I didn't know why. And then I discovered feminism. And so, um, <laughs> this King Arthur is like, 100% stealable, uh, you can kind of lean into that whenever you want to. So all of the tropes and stuff uh, from those stories, you can just do whatever you want with them. And so after I saw Jupiter Ascending, I was like, there it is. There it is right there. And uh, it's been a slow go, but I've, I've been piecing together the story ever since. Um, I've always loved Arthurian retellings. Um, ever since I was little, you know, you had the sword and the stone. Um, I loved like books about it. I loved um, the terrible, terrible Richard Gere first night movie came out when I was, yeah, no, it's so bad. I know it's so bad, but when you're a 13 year old, you're like, oh, this is so dreamy. And then you show it to your own teenager when you're an adult and you're like, oh no, uh -uh. anyway. Um, yeah, so, you know, and then T.H. White's Brilliant Once in Future King and then, um, when I was in college, I, I had a course where I, I really delved into Mallory's Arthurian um, tales and, and kind of deconstructed those. Just really loved it. Um, but, but the same thing motivated me here that motivates me in all of my retellings, which is I love something, but it also really bothers me because nearly every classic tale, it's like, I love this so much and it treats the women so bad if the women are in it at all. Um, and so, so with this one, it was definitely motivated by, I wanted a story with romance and longing and magic, and I wanted to go to Camelot, but I wanted to examine why, when we retell these stories, why we tell the stories that we do, why we focus on the stories that we do and what stories aren't we telling, because those are the ones that we're telling. Um, and so that was kind of my angle for wanting to sort of, um, tell a new Guinevere story. So I think my first exposure was Sword in the Stone, definitely the Disney, I mean, that just feels like classic to me. And what I love about that, um, I'm going to like go deep on this movie for a second, but what I love about that story and that particular presentation of Once the Future King is that it really is about um, power coming to the right person. And there's something really lovely about that, um, this idea that in this, there's a version of the world where power gets to the right person as opposed to being mm -hmm. given to someone who just happened to be present in the right place at the right time or have the right blood or have the right body or whatever it is, you know, like it just comes to the person it needs to come to for, uh, and leadership to for the people who are around them. So I, th I think that's probably the first thing that I fell in love with. And then um, I read Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising um, when I was like, and what I love about that story and, and really is like some ways Legendborn is a love letter to Susan Cooper is this idea that what you know what would the um, the foundations of the round table like what would they look like now and what you know if this were to persist as the stories have themselves persisted if that uh, history were to persist um, what would that be and so that's really the question that I 
was asking. And then in terms of like what I think I'll probably always be asking with my work, it's like who gets to be legendary and why, like what stories do we hold on to and why? And um, how can we look at the stories that are already around us and the lives and struggles that people are already living uh, and have been living and recast them and frame them as legendary or epic or mythical. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with Legendborn. Nice. Um, so obviously to have a round table, you have to have several folks um, and you all have such great uh, cast of characters. And so I was wondering who the hardest person to write was and who the easiest person to write was. And if that changed, um, for those of you who have series, um, like if that changed across books. Yeah, um, I'll go first. And also I just need to say everybody looks so nice. Like maybe I'm just really face starved right now, but I'm like, <laughs> Oh, that lip color. Oh, that hair. Oh, that scarf. You guys just look so good. Um, so thank you for giving me I have that thought too. That today. Um, <laughs> your lip color is so good, Tracy. Um, okay, so um, for me, the hardest person to write was Arthur because he is not my usual um, type to write because he's, I mean, he's a Gryffindor, let's be honest. I'm not a Gryffindor. I'll never be a Gryffindor. <laughs> and, um, and so finding ways to capture his character and his goodness and his like longing and striving for justice, but still making him accessible and real was kind of difficult for me because um, I didn't find him very interesting in my first draft. I didn't think he was interesting. And so that was something that I really had to work on. And, you know, as authors, we do a lot of research. We, we make a lot of sacrifices with our time and attention to develop characters. So I watched a lot of interviews with Chris Evans. So many, so many interviews with Chris Evans. There's that one gif of him um, where he's tearing that log in half. And I watched that at least 40 times. Um, to really I'm develop the character of King Arthur. Um, <laughs> but actually that, that helped, like thinking of him as sort of that archetype um, really helped me find some nuance with his character and get to love him so that I could write him better. Um, the character that was the easiest to write was the character who was not supposed to have a very large role in book one, and that was Mordred. Um, he was going to be just sort of this like side subtle antagonist, and then he showed up on page and he was like, hey girl, and I was like, oh, Okay, you can have a bigger part. Um, and he, you know, I love that, like, you have to question their motives, but at the same time, like, you're into them, um, which, like, explains my entire high school dating experience. Um, but, yeah, so, so Mordred was probably the easiest for me to write, and Arthur was the hardest for me to write. Hey, I'm gonna, still, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, we're going to jump in because we have a similar answer. Um, so I think in the first book, we were surprised that Morgana was so easy to write. Yes. Um, and so delightful. And it was just great to give her depth and to be like, all right, so you're the villain. You're the villain. But are you? And to kind of draw out the whole idea that, you know, Morgana is, is, is as much a part of the, of the puzzle as Merlin is and what her role is, and that was very, very exciting. Yeah, well, I'd always loved the Enchantresses of Avalon as parts of the story before yes. that, coming into this, and then I found myself in a position where I was writing Merlin, who's up against Morgana, and the sort of yeah. antagonistic this dance that they've been doing for centuries, and I'm like, but what is this really about? <laughs> because she's not going to just be the bad guy, she's my yeah. favorite. Um, so it ended up being this really fun and rewarding thing to write. I think for me, and the, the hardest character in the first book is Kay, but... I was very I'm lucky. Okay. In I'm, that. I can write. <laughs> I can write. I can write, I can write is like the a Nathan human Fillion of the movie. Log with <laughs> feelings, and he's he's beautiful, yeah. and and you know, but but K is K. K is the least magical one, and yet you you still gotta love him. He is the least magical one, but he mm -hmm. has his own. He has his own magic and heart. But it did help us to find our own inspiration, which Kirsten, I think. Uh, reminded mm -hmm. me that we did have something that we, we we spent a lot of time finding the exact perfect image for Kay and it is a very young Nathan Fillion with like a full bandana like over <laughs> we found a picture of him at like the age of 20 like a college picture of Nathan Fillion with it with a red bandana and oh, yeah. he just looks like half drunk but really happy to be there and that was like you like, are Kay way pre-Firefly but like ready to be in Firefly someday yeah that's that's our Kay <laughs> But then when we were writing Sword in the Stars, so Once in the Future takes place in the future, so so many, many, many years in the future. And then Sword in the Stars takes place in actual Camelot's court. And so, in, in, in the court, and we, so we had, we knew 
we knew King Arthur was going to be there, and to avoid spoilers, we won't tell you how much of a character he is, but we knew he was going to be there. And we ended up changing his age every draft because we didn't like him. It was like the king, when you're playing chess and you see the king and you're like, I have to protect you, but why? You're <laughs> useless to me. And so we did a draft where he was older than the teenagers and we did a draft where he was much younger than the teenagers. And then we ended up kind of making him on the edge of, of teenager and looking up to the other characters, which helped us a lot. By the end, he became a little puppy that we all fell in love with and we wanted to give him more scenes, but he wasn't the point of the book. So <laughs> it's good. That's why I love King Arthur. Sometimes King Arthur is the, the least point of the book. <laughs> um, what, what was I going to say? Uh, so I, I will go next about, and I'll talk a little bit about my favorite character or easiest character to write first, and that was Gawain. So Sir Gawain. And um, I. Um, once I figured out, or once I sort of decided on which aspects of that character I really wanted to run with, it was easy. So I am sure you all can identify with this, but like if you research any single knight from the Knights of the Round Table, you'll find like 15 different sort of variations on the theme around this person, and sometimes they're actually oppositional. Um, and Gowan's a great example of this, like that, like early things, he was supposed, he was from a historic or from a, a literature perspective, he was very like courteous and very polite, and he had this reputation of being very sort of chivalric. And then there are other iterations later where he's just like super bloodthirsty, and the courteous aspect was was a ruse. And and so I decided to stick with um, for now, I guess, because it's a series. I don't know, things change. But for now, he's he's uh, this character. Um, William is his descendant. And so, uh, just as a preface, I'm not actually writing any of the knights in Legendborn. I'm writing their descendants. And so, William is the descendant of Gowan, uh, one of many, but the one that we focus on in the book. And he's very sort of like courteous and um, uh, wise and wry and is the one who knows all of the rules and knows the in and out. But I also used him as, as an opportunity to update what I think chivalry could be. And so chivalry um, for Legendborn is an adherence to sort of the knowledge of the world, but a respect to the individuals in the world. And William is like the embodiment of that. And so that was a lot of fun to get to play with that and have someone be that person. And then in terms of difficulty, everything I say is going to be a spoiler. So I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, so I am starting off with the Fisher King is the first uh, book and so I don't really hit any of the more like name recognizable characters I guess until uh hopefully if there is a book two later on um but for me the easiest person to write is always Sir Percival or anybody who's like Sir Percival because he is so dumb you just get to explain things to him all the time he is fantastic for world building it's like it's just, he's a gift I love him so much like I was trying to figure out where I was going to put him in the story and I was like I'm giving him to Morgana. He's going to drive her nuts. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> and then the person I've been struggling with is Guinevere. Um, not because of everyone else in this group chat, but also because of everyone else in this group chat. Um, having done such what I assume is fantastic jobs with her um, and wanting to do something that's different. Um, and my tendency is always to make people nice. And sometimes I am accused of making them too nice and too perfect. Um, and I lean into that anyway, cause I, I don't really care, but my goal for Guinevere is to have her still be a relatable character, but not like the one that everybody blames everything on for the next several centuries. Um, cause I'm kind of over that. I think we're all over that. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Her back. Over yeah she's ours <laughs> Same with Morgana, to be honest. Yep. Same with Morgana, like I'm over that. Come on. Yeah. Well, when Julie Dow was watching Merlin, every time she tweeted, I was like, it doesn't get any better, honey. It doesn't get any better. Nope. Um, so, especially in today's age of internet trolldom, um, whenever an author uh, touches something that has anything to do with a canon, um, whether it be uh, Star Wars, like you're right, Kate, 
or King Arthur or anything like that, um, there is sometimes a negative response from those who see themselves as canon purists, um, which I don't think is actually a thing you can be, but that's, you know. Uh, so one of the things I love about all your stories is that even though like tones vary, um, elements change, um, they still feel like part of Star Wars. They still feel like part of King Arthur, like the larger world. Um, and so I have two sort of questions for this. One um, is what's your favorite part of getting to write in a world that has sort of already had part of it established um, before you've come along? Um, and then did you do a lot of research into the original canon um, before sculpting your own variation? I think my favorite Can part of adding, that? oh yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> I just want to, I'm not, like, it's not my full answer. We can come back to me, but I just want to say, I think the best part of this is cackling at anybody who would dare call themselves an Arthurian purist, because it, there is, it does not exist. This is <laughs> such a, such a, like, a matrix situation. Like, it's not real. There is no pure canon. There is no single story. So my favorite part about that is just laughing at people who think that they know that. You had tweeted something, which which is what had inspired the question about that, about the idea that like there's so much like different different variations of Arthurian legend. But I know that there's still there's still people who would who would come at you and be like, oh no, but this this is the this is the actual story, you know? I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you were there we, for that one line where he was like randomly dropped in. It's just a warrior and then he didn't matter, and that was the beginning of Arthurian canon. And then Merlin was imported from another story where he was just like a demon child. Yes. That's why he was magical, but he wasn't with King Arthur until later somebody was like, I know what to do. Um, yeah, no, we, canon purity makes no sense. <laughs> we definitely get, uh, we definitely get the people who need to come to us and tell us and explain to us how King Arthur is a cisgendered man hero. And when you take away his manhood, you break King Arthur. And we've had a few people. And the first one who told us this made the huge mistake of saying, this is why, this is, this is going to be just as bad as girls doing Ghostbusters. And I was like, it's my favorite movie. Thank you. <laughs> I love that movie. Um, but they, we do have, and, and it's, it, we have a ready answer for that one whenever it comes up, which is just like, well, then why don't you keep the thousands of versions in which that make you feel like you're being seen as this cis hero, and we'll take this one, and that will be fair, won't it? I'm really proud that your answer isn't just fight me. <laughs> <laughs> I hear them out. I'm just like, I, there's just more people in this world than you, pal. Like... <laughs> It's just more, so. No, we got distracted because we like to talk about trolls. Oh, the other parts um, of the questions, um, but but I, um, so Rachel had asked if we did um, research into specific parts of the canon, and we, mm -hmm. we were really lucky, I think, in that we have the same keystone text for Arthur, which is mm -hmm. definitely the Once and Future King, um, and so we. And Mrs. of Avalon. Mrs. of Avalon hit me right at the right age. Um, I'm still looking for someone else who watched the miniseries on TV with Juliana Margulies. <laughs> yes, yes, that one, like, stayed with me because I was like, wait, it's King Arthur, but girls get to be here, too. And I wasn't really aware of my own transness back then, but I knew that there was, like, this, this story was being um, messed up a lot. I, I wanted gender diversity in it. I was like, come on. Um, I was already wanting that in Star Wars and other things, too, back back in the day before we had girls in Star Wars and and then with Once and Future King we were both very much connected to the fact that it's also a piece of resistance literature it was written in the shadow of the world wars and very much yes on purpose as a dialogue about might and right and we're like okay if we're writing a book like that that deals with that that deals with these things but with humor and with with humanity and like how can, can we write um an Arthurian update that that draws on that and feels like that in a lot of ways but but has has the gender diversity it has queer people yeah. and has you know just and has a conversation for for the problems that we are facing right now um that was a big thing we wanted to write about um 
you want to write about capitalism, um, you want to make capitalism a bad guy. <laughs> um, I like going into a story, um, most of my books are retellings anyway, and I like going into a story and like finding the part that, I don't know, betrayed me as a child. Like when you grow up and you're like, oh no, uh, finding that part and stealing it. Um, and then doing my own version. So with with King Arthur, um, there are a couple of betrayals in there, um, some of which are incredibly personal, obviously, but um, I was excited to kind of take that story and, and twist it a little bit. Um, also, I loved Jupiter Ascending unironically. I think I might be one of like 10 people in the world who love that movie unironically. <laughs> and uh, and I remember walking out of the theater and being like, that was amazing. And then the internet was like, that was terrible. And I'm like, you're all wrong. I'm going to prove it. Um, and, and in a sort of very backwards way, I get to do that a little bit with Star Wars. Not to quite the same extreme, obviously. But I do get to go in and be like, I'm going to add some queer characters. And I'm going to add some characters who aren't white necessarily and also aren't aliens. And um, sort of push those envelopes as far as I can. Um, and it's good, it's really good practice for writing my own stuff too, because by the time I get back to writing my own books, I'm like, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I don't have to be as subtle yeah. anymore. Um, and it's, it's, to me, it's always fun to sort of go into those stories and sort of hit that corner and just stake out like where you want things to be better. Mm -hmm. Um, and to try and leave the door open so that someone else can read the story and be like, oh, I'm going to take this and do it this way. Like when I met Tracy and she was like, I'm writing a King Arthur book. I was like, yes, <laughs> more King Arthur books. Um, because I knew she was going to have a different take and it was going to be fantastic. And like, there's going to be, we like accidentally hit this trend um, and it's going to be weird and fun and people are going to yell at us a lot, but like, I don't care. It's going to be fantastic. Um, so I think, you know, I was thinking about this question earlier and, you know, I, in my other life, I am a, like a fandom academic. So I'm going to sound a little bit like that, Tracy, for a second and just say that, you know, the thing about um, fandom that I love the most and you look at fan fiction is, is how uh, there's just sort of a shared agreement that we can play with some of the same core materials, but then tell a completely different story. And so I see, you know, Arthuriana is 1500 years old. And it, it's, it's been touched by so many different writers and so many different voices in, who are writing in so many different contexts, right? And so I think it's sort of naturally absorptive. I, I see, I think Arthuriana is all headcanon by its very nature. Like it's just really seriously people headcanon, but on paper and some of it's old. So it gets this sort of weird primacy, but like in a hundred years, my book will hopefully still be around and it'll be really old. And they'll be like, remember that? That was weird. So I see Legendborn is like a contribution to a tradition that's already been in place, which is that Arthur and King Arthur and these stories are something that people can play with and manipulate and um, pick and choose. Like I think of it as like a, like a toolbox, like you pull the drawer open and there's all these different tools and materials and then you pick out what you need for that project and then you shove the door. So like I didn't need all of Arthuriana. I certainly didn't need all of the various dozens of knights that have ever been mentioned at any point. Um, I just needed the ones that I needed. And so I think, you know, I worked with a lot of researchers um, uh, either, either on the page or in person. I was lucky enough to work with three medievalists. Um, who just got the project and chew very, very closely. Um, and one of them is also a fanfic writer. So it was great because she could speak that language and say like, dude, like, I know you really liked one thing, but like, let it go. Like, you don't need it. This is someone who has a degree, right? In medievalism and was like, you just like, let it go. Like, you don't need that. Like, I don't, I don't understand why you're still holding on to this part of this character or that part of the story. And so luckily I had medievalists around me who were giving me permission, um, even though I didn't feel like I needed it, but I, it was good to get a reminder from someone who had dedicated years to studying King Arthur, right? Like, and, and it was a validation, I think. So yeah, I feel like King Arthur invites invention and reincarnation at its core. Um, and so I think we're all just part of the, part of the tradition really, but doing it like in much more badass 
gender friendly, race friendly ways. Like I specifically wanted to put King Arthur and what I know of that up against conversations about race because legit have never seen it before. Like can we talk about how race and oppression and inequality would bump up against this very cis hetero legend and story that would get preserved, I'm sure, because cis hetero power loves preserving itself. So like how would, you know, how would other experiences bump up against this and what would it look like was my question. Like very similar to Corey and Amy Rose, I think it was just like, actually there's some things happening today. Let's see how we can put those things in conversation with this very old set of stories. Yeah, I love that. Um, and Tracy, I loved your whole Twitter thread. It made me so happy. Um, because Arthuriana is fan fiction. It's been fan fiction from day one. It's been somebody saying, oh, I like that idea. I'm going to write something about it. Oh, I like that thing that other person wrote. I'm going to develop it. Oh, I liked that, but I'm going to change these aspects of it. Oh, I like that, but I'm going to add this character. On and on and on throughout the centuries. Um, and, you know, I've written I've written a few other retellings. I've written in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer universe. Um, and in those ones, it was such like a limited canon, especially the most limited one was um, The Dark Son of Elizabeth Frankenstein, because my canon was the life of Mary Shelley and the actual text of Frankenstein. And so, um, you know, and then I did their retelling of Lodi and Taylor's life. And so I did just thousands of pages of historical research because I wanted to be as accurate as I could on as many things as I could, um, particularly with the history. And so when I set out to do this, um, to, to write The Gwen of Her Deception, I was like, going to research fifth century England. And I started researching fifth century England. And then I was like, oh no, I don't want to do, I do not want to do this. And then I was like, you know what? Arthurian retellings have been anachronistic since day one. They have always been anachronistic. They have always existed in this sort of nebulous time period that never happened. So I'm going to lean into that hard. And then I was like, you know, I, I could do... Um, this is actually the retelling that I did the least amount of research on because for me, I wanted to lean into the archetypes. I wanted to lean into the archetype of, of a Lancelot, of an Arthur, of a Guinevere, um, of a Mordred. And, and then I wanted to just have fun with the story. I just wanted to tell a good story. So with this one, it was very much less a priority for me to be accurate to what came before than it was to, um, and this is one of my favorite things about retelling is to take what people already know and either build on it or subvert it. And that's the fun thing with retellings is people come in with expectations. They come on with an idea of what this story is going to be and who these characters are. And so, so yeah, you have that existing base that you can then build on or subvert. And that is really exciting to me as a storyteller. Um, and so that's what I mostly focused on. Um, so I actually did very little. I mean, I did do, re I, I did do a lot of research, but compared to my other projects, my other retelling projects, it was much less um, research intensive because of the freedom of Arthurian retellings, because they have existed for so long in so many formats, there is no canon, which is really wonderful. Um, it's, it's so much nicer. Oh boy. And it's also really nice to be able to be like, would this thing have been possible back then? Well, magic. Instead of, <laughs> would this thing have been possible back then? Well, let's research every grad student's thesis that got placed online about clothing conventions in the Ottoman Empire and then still not know the answer. So, yeah. I always I love how like the openings, the opening title card of that uh, Clive Owen, Kira Knightley, Arthur uh, movie, which opens with most historians agree. And honestly, I don't know what it says after that because I'm always <laughs> laughing too hard. Reading. It is my favorite part of that movie, like without exception, because it's so ridiculous. Yeah. I love how all of us are like, like if it's like introduce your King Arthur retelling and all of us are somewhere in the background of each other's like banging the pots and pans of subversion. <laughs> <laughs> like, like we're just like subversion, sub, subvert it, subvert it. <laughs> like that's what everyone's doing actually. <laughs> okay, um, so are there other things that you would want to retell or do an IP project for? Um, like, are there other sandboxes you want to play in? Yes. Well, what are they? <laughs> um, I, I have some pitches out that I can't talk about because I'm hopeful. Um, obviously, I would love to write more in Star Wars. Um, my Little Pony Friendship is Magic is over now, so that was like my goal for a while. Um, I don't know how that's going to work out, but uh, 
I also really enjoy uh, both Dragon Age and Teen Titans, but I have very much been enjoying them as hobbies. So I think I'm like pushing back on the idea of like turning them into work somehow, if it was even possible. Definitely doing doing IP work and, and working within a universe changes your relationship to it. So if you primarily engage with it as a fan, suddenly you're engaging with it um, on a different level. And like, I won't say it changed the way that I feel about Buffy to have written Slayer and Chosen in the Buffy verse, um, but it definitely changes your relationship with it and the way that you think about it. Um, and so there are definitely some things where I'm like, I don't know that I would want to write IP in that world because I want to protect the way that I feel about it. Um, that being said, I have flung myself at various franchises and been like, hey, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> um, so I was like, Detective Pikachu, okay, we're opening up the world, love it. <laughs> it is time for a YA Pokemon novel. Like, <laughs> of course it is. And like, um, you know, purely self-serving also, my 15 year old has always loved Pokemon. Um, she can see the silhouette of any Pokemon ever and tell you what it is, what its evolutions are, what its powers are, et cetera. Um, and I wanted to buy her love. And so I was like, I'm going to write a Pokemon YA novel. So I found a contact at Scholastic because Scholastic publishes Pokemon tie-ins. And I was like, hey, I want to write a Pokemon YA novel. I think the time is right for it. But it's a success of Detective Pikachu. We can open up the world. Like, um, and then you've got people who have been playing Pokemon and loving Pokemon since they were children. They're adults now. They have kids now. Everybody loves Pokemon. Let's do it. And they were like, you know what? I think this might work. Write a proposal, write a pitch, and I'll take it to the Pokemon executives. They've always been very protective of, of the, of the um, licensing, but this might be the time. So I did. And it was so glorious. It was going to be a girl. And she had a, a water type Pokemon rescue center because all these irresponsible parents gave their kids water type Pokemon that then evolve and are really hard to take care of because you've got this huge creature that has water as its base in your backyard. Like, come on, think this through, parents. Like, it's not going to be a magic heart forever, is it? And so she takes them in and rescues them. And she also lost her mother at sea in mysterious circumstances. But then, it's, but then rare Pokemon are getting stolen. She gets framed for it and has to team up with a bunch of misfits with their, their companion Pokemon. You guys, it was so glorious. It was so good. And so I wrote it all out and we sent it to Pokemon and they passed um, because they're very, very protective of the Pokemon property, which I actually really respect. I respect that they're not just like farming it out for a buck wherever they can. So they told me that like, you know, if I wanted to maybe develop something that was part of one of their storylines of the, of the television series, I could, but I was like, well, you know, I, I just really missed it. <laughs> she had a Vaporeon, come on. Anyway, um, so this is what I do in my spare time. I'm like, let's make a Pokemon YA novel. And then they're like, mm, thank you, but no. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I respect you. Anyway, um, but yeah, so this is what I do. Right now, I'm actually writing a, um, a Kylo Ren series on Twitter. <laughs> it. um, it's very good. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's what would happen if Kylo was your, was your sullen housemate and you were also sort of his parental figure during lockdown. It's not going well. Um, <laughs> Anyway, no, yeah, I just, I love, I love playing, I love playing with things. Um, I would, I'm definitely open to doing more IP work um, and more retellings. I didn't ever set out to become a retelling author, but it's kind of happened and I'm okay with it. Uh, so I thought about this question for a long time because there are, like Kate, there are some things that I feel like I'm like, I don't want to say either because I'm like flinging myself out there towards them or because I might or whatever, I don't know, um, publishing's weird. But so I, I feel like what I can say though, the two things that, I, that have popped into my mind and have like lived there for a very, very long time, um, The Never Ending Story. <laughs> like I really have very strong feelings about The Never Ending Story. Um, and so much so that my one and only tattoo is Big Orin and it's huge and on my back. So if you ever see me, you should ask, um, but that, I will show it to you happily. But yeah, so the Neverending Story, like I, I don't know if it's the Neverending Story as it is, or if it's like a sequel with Bastion, Balthazar, Bastion's daughter, or something. But there's just something about that that I've really been like churning over since I was, you know, like 11. Um, and then the other one, this is gonna sound really like I just realized it already sort of happened. But um, the, ne the the Tomorrow People. Do you remember the Tomorrow People? It was a series that was like originally in the 70s and British, and then it was like 
Canadian, and then they brought it back recently, and it didn't really do well. It was a teen show, but it basically it's like about these. The next stage of human evolution is these kids who can teleport, and they also uh, have uh, basically like a shared sort of telepathy. So they could hear each other's thoughts, and there's like a spaceship that they can go to. Anyway, I realized that Sense8 sort of already did this in a way, um, and so it'd be sort of in that same vein of like a group of people who are in different places in the world, and you end up having this, this sort of like shared experience mind thing, and they're figuring out the rules of how they live in each other's uh, brains. That's sort of like on my far off list of Maybe I could revive it. I don't know. Like, I, just make it a book. Don't make it a TV show. They've tried three times, so I feel like it's time to hand it to us. Hand it to the writers. Like, let's let's let's, let's fix it. We can do it. Um, it, uh, just just to interrupt really fast. As soon as Tracy said "Neverending Story," Amy Rose and I both freaked out. I'm wearing an RN right now. Um, <laughs> and I saw Amy Rose. You had an RN necklace at a festival we were at together, and I was so jealous of it that I searched for one, and I finally found a good one. Oh um, so God. yes, we are we are like we are each other's people. <laughs> we are. I'm like, where's my? Oh, I'm like, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull down while someone else is talking. I'm gonna pull down my first edition. <laughs> I think we still. Oh yeah, we still have the. Yeah. Answer that one. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to keep putting this out there until I'm just going to keep throwing this one into the void. If anyone needs Winona Earp YA novels, they should talk to us. They should talk to us. They should. We're here. I mean, we name drop Emily Andrus in the acknowledgments of once and future. Talk about putting things out into the universe. I just, she's she's really nice. We love, yes. Yes. So that would be fantastic. Really, if there's any Canadian TV show that wants us to write spinoff YA fiction, <laughs> you should just come talk to us. Yeah, I, I, I did. I did actually like talk to my film agent, and I was like, I, I need something from. Never asked for anything from you before. I need to know how to get this book to Emily Andrus. <laughs> and he helped me. It was wonderful. But um, IP, we we've we've done some tryouts for some things, and some things, and some things we can't talk about because they're still in the process of being exciting things and they might feature one of the many action figures that are behind us. Um, they might, they might not, I don't know. <laughs> I, um, I, I have always, I have always longed to, to do Superman and to do, I want to do trans Superman. Um, and that is something that I'm going to hopefully keep putting out into the world. Like, oh, well, I feel the same way as Tracy. Like, there's some things that we want to, like, some legends we want to retell, but we're like, it's hard to say it out loud at first. But I'm, I'm going to keep yelling trans Superman and hope that someone hears me. Well, we do have contact with DC, so maybe. You never know. Um, <laughs> uh, what was the other part of the question? Do you remember? I think that was it. That was retellings. it. It was about EP, yeah, IP and retellings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, oh, the next thing that we're working on retelling. Oh, yes. Oh, what? You should say I'm that sorry, guys. I really want this one to happen for Amy Rose. Amy oh, Rose is a character that's for, very close to their heart, and I've been saying this for a while. But but Wednesday Adams books, I really I just you know it's time. It's something I would love to do. Um, but yeah. The next thing we're retell we're working on, an, on our next thing together, which mm -hmm. is which is sort of a retelling, and sort of not. It is taking on a very different uh, source material. It's based on our love story, which is just as <laughs> we decided is just as epic as anything else we could pick up and try to retell. But you know, it's and something that we need a whole book to explain. Yes, because it's it's quite <laughs> difficult. People people they don't know how we happened, know. and it was many years over many trials. And it was, <laughs> There were a lot of swords involved and dragons. We added um, some some genre some elements, some demons, maybe. yeah, or or maybe those parts were real. You don't know. And then it's also in space because space fantasy is just like it's so important to us. Like we wrote space fantasy, and 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 most of Sword in the Stars takes place in the past. Some of it does take place in the future, but I I, I love writing about space. So I found my I found my first edition. Sure. Let's see. So, so it's this, this is the like illuminated letters oh. version of the never ending story. So the beginning of each chapter is like that. And then this is also good. You can see yes. the text that is green. 
is in the world and the text that's red is in our world. So this is Fantastica and this is our world. Is this not bananas? Like, can you is imagine? That, is that how you know that it's the first edition? Because I have the exact same copy that you do. Does it have the red cloth bound front? Like under, Yes. Yes. Yes, it has yeah. that. Under that. Yes. Yeah. With the orange yeah, and it is, on the, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty wonderful. Um, and then I just want to go back and just say that this is what I'm asking is what do we call legendary? Because y'all's love story sounds fairly epic. Could be legendary. I don't know. I mean, what are the qualities that make something legendary? Let's figure it out. Like it actually, there's a, a kernel of history, is kernel of truth. And then there's magic. What? Meetings over many years? I think it, I think it's right itself. Love that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it was there was great peril and great cost and great reward at the end. So it, it lends itself to story really well. And also yeah. we wanna clear some things up, but in a in a narrative way. <laughs> Amazing. Um, do y'all have any favorite r knights of the round table or other characters if they're not knights? If you if you hate all the knights, that's fine too. That's valid. <laughs> I love reading the legends because they're so, some of them are so stupid. Oh my gosh, they're so stupid. Um, and it makes me happy that we told s such stupid stories for so long. My favorite that I found while researching um, for book two was um, Yvain and his brother, Yvain. Like, <laughs> so you have Yvain and Yvain the Bastard. <laughs> mean parents. Um, and I think Yvain has a lion, but sometimes Yvain the Bastard also has a lion. So it's a, it, can be, it can be a little bit confusing. Um, I will say one, one thing that really frustrated me, because um, honestly, I didn't care that much about the knights. Like I developed a couple of them because I needed them for the narrative. I really love Sir Tristan um, in my in my books, but uh, I I have Sir Gawain in book two and um and book three, and I kind of made him this like a little bit dopey round face, just puppy. And then they came out with a trailer for Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and I was like, dang, now he's the hottest one. <laughs> oh. And he's so hot now, and in my books, he's not, and I can't go back and revise it to make him Dev Patel in my books, because then why would anybody care about any other character? So uh, that, was a that was a little bit frustrating, because I was like, dang it, now he's going to be our favorite knight, and I missed it, but that's all right. That's why we just keep telling stories, right? I have always loved Morgana the most, um, which is probably not a huge surprise. Um, and I like how the stories tend to be either very forgiving of her or not forgiving of her, depending on who's telling them um, and how everything changes around. I also like Percy, obviously, um, and Tristan um, quite a bit. Not coincidentally, both of those characters do appear in Trash King Arthur, which we haven't talked about yet, BT Dev. <laughs> um, not that I'm keeping track or anything, but those, those three, the... Morgan and uh, and Sir Tristan and Sir Percival are probably my favorites. Kate, for those who are not in the know, can you explain what Trash King Arthur is? I mean, I I know I'm in the. <laughs> You're in the. So line. a few years ago, uh, a beautiful and perfect movie called <laughs> King Arthur: Legend of the Sword came out, and uh, it's the best ever. I mean, there's some fridging, but nobody's perfect. Um, anyway, we call it Trash King Arthur because it's made by Guy Ritchie, so it's basically shot like a heist movie, even though they're not stealing anything except your heart. Um, and it is beautiful. And if, if I write a book that's even approaching that tone, I'll be very, very pleased with what I've done. I think it's on Netflix. <laughs> stealing your heart and also stealing, like, sin. I feel like there's, <laughs> there's like it so makes no sense. I love it so much. You're yeah. just like it's like aggressively anti sense. <laughs> it is. It was the tipping point, actually. Um, it was the tipping point of because I've been saying for years that I was going to work on a Girl King Arthur book, and then I would just be like, except not now, except not now. And Amy Rose and I do this thing where we we kind of. Uh, 
it's not great quizzing each other, but um, I will be like, tell me every book that you want to write and I'll write down the list. It's every book you can imagine writing. Yeah. Like even if it doesn't make any sense, like it's, it's, doesn't a, mean it's, it's a book, it's a book where there's a turtle and a purple sky and we're like, that's a book that's in your head. Like that's an already a spot where there's a book someday going to be written for that. And so I always had like my list and then the very end I was like, and then girl came up with it. And then I would just say it very sad because I didn't just think I could ever do it. Very softly as a footnote. <laughs> like, and I was like, I mean, girls would be like, you know, we, you should work on that. And I'm like, no, because the minute I sit down and start writing Girl King Arthur, Neil Gaiman is going to be like, look, I wrote Girl King Arthur. And we're all going to yay, Neil Gaiman. And then I watched Trash King Arthur and I was like, Guy Ritchie, game on. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was announced and you were like, all right, this is happening. I was watching the trailer and I was like, oh, we can do was... anything we want. Yes. Because I think Rachel described it like the King Arthur sandbox. And I was like, it's, a, it's an ocean of sand with everybody <laughs> throwing things in. And then we all get to go in there and take out what we want. And we get to, and we get to you know, um, make our own sandcastle out of that sand. And that was what was so much fun working on these books. And honestly, like Sword in the Stars came out last week. And we're, we're still like in a grieving process of saying goodbye to the series. And so it's like, I, it's really, really special that we actually got to talk to all of you and, and, and think, and talking Arthur, because we've all been yelling at each other on the internet. I, I, um, yeah, Rachel yeah. said that you guys aren't going to be able to see our reactions on the video, but just so you know, there was a lot of hopping up and down <laughs> for people's, because we've all had similar experiences of similar, like, excitements and frustrations, and, um, Yes, it's, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. And I just wanted to take a minute for anybody who's watching this and who's also working on their book that has King Arthur elements in it or is a retelling. I can't wait to read it. Keep writing it. It's going to be wonderful. Make sure you put something in it that's from you that no one else could have written. And then it's the best King Arthur you could have written. So I want to follow up with that and say that uh, I don't think there's a date, like a release date yet or a year, but L.L. McKinney is doing a middle grade King Arthur story where her King Arthur is a black girl and who is the reincarnation, I believe, and has to gather her knights to fight Morgana. And um, I think it's going to have a lot of sort of video game elements. And that's just, I love that there's something like that for for middle grade kiddos. Um, and I know it's because it's Al who did play so bad black, I'm sure that it's gonna feel very much like a story written um, not just about King Arthur, but about about heroism and race and, and all of those things and what it means when you put all of that in conversation. I sidetracked this a little bit with Trash King Arthur, but other people sometimes might still need to answer who their favorite knights are. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I forgot too. Um, so I will go. I I don't. I mean, I do have a favorite night. Um, I think I'm going to. I think it'll be a spoiler to mention, so I'm not going to talk about it. This is rough. I've got a book coming out soon, and I'm like looking at all my reveals, and I'm like, I revealed myself into a hole. I'm gonna have to figure out how to talk about this book <laughs> because there's just like a lot of stuff that's in there that I don't want to tell people on. But I would love to tell you my favorite story, my favorite King Arthur story, just very briefly, because it is bananas. It is um, about Arthur. It's really mostly from the point of view of the saint. So Saint Karen Talk, or I think in well, she's Karen Karen Nog. Um, and the saint has a like portable floating altar. I don't know what this looks like, but I imagine it's just like, you know, a, a, float, a, a piece of wood that you stand at, like a lectern that just floats everywhere. I don't know. So he has a floating altar and he loses it or can't find it. Arthur has it because Arthur stole it and tried to use it as a table. I don't know what type of table or why you would do that. Arthur is kind of a himbo. So like, he, <laughs> I guess was like, this is a good idea. The saint finds out and is like, I want my table back. And Arthur says, okay, but there's a dragon over here that needs to be slain. If you slay the dragon, then I'll give you your table back. Like, what a jerk. <laughs> like, like <laughs> King Arthur, like, I'm sure he can take on a dragon. I'm sure he's capable, but he was like, no, 
I stole it from you, but to get it back from, from, from me, you'll have to do this thing for me. That, like how much of a jerk would steal your stuff and then make you kill a dragon to get it back? And so the saint does it and then gets the altar. And then I think, well, like, I think Arthur like uh, gets him some land and that's where the monastery is or something like that. But I remember reading that and being like, hands up. This is why any of these canon purists that want to come around, I'll be like, listen to this story. You make it, make it make sense. <laughs> Flipping table theft. <laughs> Love it. I'm imagining the accompanying boat slash car chase. It's very amusing. <laughs> With the dragon, who was probably doing nothing, let's be honest. Innocent. <laughs> Innocent dragon. What's your favorite uh, night? I can say this because I didn't create this character, you did. I'm going to say, Jordan, who is a knight that you created for our that table. That is true. Jordan is uh, an addition to that. the Arthurian canon. I hope, I hope Jordan gets a Wikipedia page someday. That's my, that's my career goal. That's my end game. Um, thank you. That's wonderful. I love Jordan. There was, I, we, we had all these characters mapped after all of these important figures. And once in the future, and then I was like, and then there's Jordan. Oh, She's yeah. important. She's the, right, and I mean, you knew she was important. You mm -hmm. knew she had to be there. She's the best she's, knight. She's the best knight on any on any known planet, and she she is the the best knight on the Renfair planet, which is Gwen's mm -hmm. planet in her book. Yep. Um, and because Gwen has a planet, right? I was also going to say she? I was going to say that my favorite um, knight is Guinevere because there's no reason that she doesn't get to be a knight and a queen at the same time. And yeah, I, I've, always, I've always wanted people to do more with Guinevere and to make her a badass. And there are several lovely people here who have done exactly that. It's been really, really fun to talk about all of your books at whatever we're talking about. <laughs> about like, it's, it's really been very exciting to have like an entire, like, I don't know, uh, I can't come up with the right word. Mini canon, like of what Sub we're doing. Right canon, now. yes. Sub canon. You no, know, it is exciting, and like, and like you brought up Elma Heaney's book, upcoming book, and it's so nice because um, with Arthuriana, because it is so big, and all these books are and can be so different. It's so fun because when people like my series, I get to say, "Well, guess what else you have?" Like out right now, you have Amy Rose and Corey series upcoming. You have a Tracy series, and and it's just, it's great because there's just so many stories there. And it's not like if you've read one, the other ones are going to be so similar that you're going to be like, oh, I already read this story. Like, no, you haven't. You've never read this version of the story. And, and like, yeah, like, like you were saying, like, I brought you guys on tour with me <laughs> because anytime people were like, oh, do you have any other Arthurian recommendations? I'm like, I do. I do. Um, and it is, it's, it's just, it's great. And it's so fun to be in sort of this just companionship, this veritable round table of authors championing, championing new stories in Arthuriana. It's really exciting. Uh, well, thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to do this. Can we go down the invisible line? once more and reiterate who you are, what your book is, um, and where people can find you on the internet. I'm E.K. Johnston. My Arthurian book is forthcoming, but my next book out is Star Wars Queen's Peril on June 2nd. On the internet, I'm E.K. underscore Johnston on Twitter and Instagram, and E.K. Johnston no underscore on Tumblr because you can't have underscores on Tumblr. Someone else has to go now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Amy Rose Capetta, and um, I'm Corey McCarthy, and we co wrote Once in Future, which is King Arthur in Space, and Sword in the Stars, which just came out to the end of the series. Mm -hmm. And that's so that series is out and complete, and, and it's very campy. And if you <laughs> this is my favorite part of working on these books is that I have a lot of people who come to me who've read some of my other books which are a little bit darker and more and more serious and they look at me and they're like it seems like you and Amy Rose had a lot of fun while you were writing this and I'm like yes we did 
we really like did. we might not know we <laughs> might not know like just so you know the fun came through it was fun and i was like fun and camp yes, yes. and you can find us on the internet um at our names you can look us up uh, uh my name is spelled differently in real life than it is on the cover of my book so if you're looking for me you want Corey with the y and you will if you google either one you'll find me I'll go next. Uh, I'm Tracy Dion. The first book in my contemporary fantasy Arthuriana YA series is called Legendborn, and it comes out September 15, 2020. It looks like this. What? This is like an early proof, but this is like a like it, I know. Can you see that foil? Like on like her arms and yes. That's yes. Uh, so that's September 15th, um, and I will probably have a lot more news about it as we get closer to its release date. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Tracy Dion, two N, T R A C Y D E O N N. Um, and then you can also find me at tracydion.com. I'm Kirsten White. Um, my newest trilogy is the Camelot Rising trilogy. The Guinevere Deception is available everywhere now. Uh, the Camelot Betrayal comes out on November 10th, and then book three will be out next year. Um, you can find me online at Kirsten White on Twitter, at author Kirsten White on Instagram, or just kirstenwhite.com. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Thank Rachel. you, Rachel.